Chapter Five of King and Baronage, A.D. 1135 to 1327, by William Holden Hutton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. The Reign of Henry the Third, 1216 to 1272. John had left five young children. Of these, two were boys. The elder, Henry, was just nine years old when his father died, and his brother Richard was two years younger. It was well for England that the heir of the evil king was an innocent child. The strong party which had invited Louis and was pledged to support him, and which would certainly have soon overcome the mercenaries of John, had no liking for the Frenchman save as a champion against the tyranny of their hated sovereign louis had married blanche the granddaughter of henry the second and in default of a better candidate he might have been accepted as king but the claim of a child had far more to recommend it the barons knew that they could hold the government themselves till he was grown up and they thought they could give a direction to the policy of the crown which it would not be easy afterwards to alter the young henry they had in their own hands Louis as king meant the great Philip to reckon with, and it might be that England would be again drawn at the chariot wheels of a foreign power. The barons had learnt that they were Englishmen, and were soon ready to claim England for the English. On October 28, 1216, the young Henry was crowned at Gloucester. The Pope's legate Juallo, Peter de Rush, Bishop of Winchester, whom John had made justiciar after the death of Geoffrey Fitzpeter, William, Earl of Pembroke, the Marshal, and some faithful barons stood by him. They wisely showed that they intended to rule as the nation willed, by reissuing the Great Charter, leaving out, however, the articles which provided that taxation should only be granted by the Great Council louis on the other hand showed signs that he intended to rule england as a french province and when he went back to france to gather more troops many of the english who had before followed him went over to the side of henry the third the new pope honorius the third took up very strongly the side of the young king as a vassal of rome and recognized the great charter which innocent the third had condemned so on april eighteenth 1217 the legate excommunicated louis and the barons who supported him on may twentieth william the marshal totally defeated the french party at lincoln all day long the fight raged in the narrow streets of the old hill town and the conquerors plundered where they could so that they each returned to their lords as rich men and the battle was called lincoln fair louis now found himself in a hard strait he sought more help from France, but the fleet was scattered by the ships of the loyal sink ports under Hubert de Burgh, now Justiciar, in the Dover Straits, on August 24th, and Louis himself was besieged in London by William the Marshal. On September 11th, a treaty was made by which Louis agreed to leave England on being absolved by the Church, and Henry promised to forgive the rebel barons and to observe Magna Carta so the young king was left without rival and for two years more the land throve under the wise rule of william the marshal the charter was issued anew with provisions against grants of lands to monks for the abolition of feudal services and for the regular holding of the local courts a new forced charter was also given in which the harsh rules of henry the second and john were withdrawn next the king's wise minister banished from the kingdom the mercenaries whom king john had employed at the beginning of twelve eighteen many of the barons went on crusade among them robert fitzwalter who had led the lords who won the charter archbishop stephen langton had returned from italy and added his prudent counsels to those of pandolf who was now legate in 1219 the good earl marshal died and hubert de burgh was chief ruler of the land he was not popular among the barons who regarded him as an upstart but he was a strong man and gradually he brought the land to peace and quiet in 1224 
he at last managed to obtain the banishment of fox de brote a ruffian whom john had employed and who had made himself rich and powerful since his master had died langdon became pope's legate and peter de roche and other foreigners became gradually less prominent in twelve twenty seven henry declared himself of age and from this time the influence of his personal character began to be seen he was very unlike his father he was a brave knight and a pious christian gentle courteous and kindly yet he was far from being a great man and he had many faults he was vain and changeable he had none of his grandfather's wisdom and some of his father's falseness he meant well but he did ill and his long reign of fifty-six years was one of the weakest if not the worst in english history but nevertheless in his own day he seemed at times a magnificent figure england in his day kept something of the great position she had held under the conqueror henry i henry the second and richard i henry the third filled in europe a position created for him perhaps by the labours of his grandfather and uncle brought into prominence by the failure and fall of frederick the second the roman emperor and made influential by his close connection with the other sovereigns of christendom but out of all proportion to his ability he was magnificent liberal a patron of art and a benefactor of foreigners his reputation for wealth laid him open to the extortions of all the needy in europe his patronage of them left him poor and his poverty brought out his meanness and deceit at home it is easier indeed to draw a clear picture of henry the third than of many of our early kings his reign even more than that of henry the second was an age of great chroniclers and his court was honourably noted for its patronage of learned men matthew paris a monk of st albans eleven ninety five to twelve fifty nine was the best latin writer of the century he was often employed abroad on diplomatic missions received constant information from the court and had access to many state documents he was a traveller a courtier and a politician as well as a monk and he was admitted to a close intimacy with the king and his brother richard from his lively pages we obtain a clear notion of the part which the clergy played in the politics of the time and are able to understand how the king's character struck the men of his own day matthew paris is never afraid of expressing a severe judgment on henry's weakness or of hinting broadly at his lack of honourable steadfastness besides matthew paris we have adam of marsh a learned franciscan who was honoured both by king and queen and was the trusted counsellor of simon de montfort he who was equally at home at the court and in literature or serving the wretched and the vile and performing the prime and essential duties of a friar thomas of wyx robert of gloucester william of rishanger were other writers of prominence who have left vivid pictures of the england of henry the third and robert grosteste eleven seventy five to twelve fifty three bishop of lincoln in his letters has expressed with unmistakable force and truth the feeling of englishmen with regard to the great political and religious crisis in which he was engaged it was an age of great chroniclers of men who were no longer content to give a bare record of facts but who judged public events for themselves and boldly criticised the times and the men it was an age too of great kings and the henry the third whom the contemporary historians picture for us was little worthy to stand beside louis the saint of france or innocent the fourth and gregory the ninth astute and powerful popes or alfonso the learned of castile or frederick the second the wonder of the world the young king when he declared he would be his own minister did not cease to employ hubert de burgh till twelve thirty two the wise minister prevented the worst effects of the king's rashness and suspicions in twelve twenty eight henry fought in wales in twelve thirty he crossed to brittany and thence passed to gascony and his men under the young richard the marshal to whom the king had given his sister eleanor in marriage obtained some success against louis the ninth of france 
but the french wars were a constant drain on england and gascony over which the king's brother richard earl of cornwall was set to rule was hard to govern and again and again was in revolt against the english added to this the popes who had so wisely kept england for henry while he was a minor now made repeated demands for money to help them in their wars in italy henry was not the man to overcome these difficulties in twelve thirty two he dismissed hubert de burgh declaring him a traitor and gave england into the hands of the poitevin peter de roche bishop of winchester and the foreigners who surrounded him all the good ministers of the king's early years were now dead stephen langton had been succeeded as archbishop by edmund rich a pious scholar but a man unequal to advise in a stormy time henry foolishly offended all those who wished for a just and firm government and richard the marshal the leader of the barons was driven into open revolt and leagued with the princes of wales henry was defeated when he tried to crush the revolt earl richard tried to raise ireland but was treacherously assassinated before this the king had been forced to learn how ill he was being counselled and he dismissed bishop peter and made peace with his barons a new period began with the king's marriage in eleven thirty six his sisters had already made alliances which might prove of political import eleanor's wedding was the pledge of friendship with the constitutional baronage joan had married alexander the second king of scots in twelve thirty five isabel married the emperor frederick the second in the next year henry himself married eleanor daughter of raymond the fourth count of provence whose sisters were or became the wives of louis the ninth of france of his brother charles of anjou and of richard earl of cornwall with these foreign connections foreigners poured into england and the national feeling already aroused by the papal demands and the needs of the king's continental lands grew steadily in intensity demanding that england should support only its own folk the king was already becoming overwhelmed by financial difficulties year after year he was asking his council for more money and year after year the pope's demands also increased men everywhere spoke of the waste and prodigality of the court and protested against the avarice of rome and the corruption of the pope's officials the burden pressed most heavily on the clergy a song of the time says free and held in high esteem the clergy used to be none were cherished more or loved more heartily enslaved now betrayed brought low they are abased sore by those from whom their help should come i dare no more king and pope alike in this to one purpose hold how to make the clergy yield their silver and their gold this is the sum the pope of rome yields too much to the king to aid his crown the tithes lays down to his liking clergy and barons alike protested archbishop edmund warned henry against allowing a papal legate to land earl richard of cornwall the king's brother says matthew paris was the first to call the king to account he sharply rebuked him for the great desolation that he had made in the realm and because day after day on new-fangled and captious pretexts he spoiled his own barons of their goods and thoughtlessly bestowed all he could scrape together on the enemies of the kingdom who were plotting both against him and his realm year by year henry added to the discontent in twelve thirty eight his sister eleanor now left a widow by her husband's murder in ireland was married to simon de montfort earl of leicester son of the famous crusader of the same name who had put down the albigenses of southern france simon the younger had been confirmed by the favour of the king as earl of leicester as heir to his mother the daughter of henry the second's justiciar and was high in favour at court for his chivalrous character and handsome person the marriage excited general indignation it was thought that earl simon was but another greedy foreigner and that the king was giving himself more and more into their hands 
Earl Richard of Cornwall became leader of the malcontents. At that time, says Matthew Paris, sure hopes were entertained that Earl Richard would free the land from the wretched slavery it experienced at the hands of Romans and other foreigners, and every one from boys to old men heaped constant blessings on his name. But it needed years of misrule before the church and barons should be strong enough to reform the government, and meanwhile matters went from bad to worse. In the church, the pope's demands grew year by year. In 1237 came a legate Otto who demanded a fifth of all the clergy's goods for a war against the emperor Frederick II. His arrogance offended everyone and led to a tumult at Oxford, where the scholars of the new-founded schools or university set upon him and drove him from the town. In 1240, Earl Richard and Earl Simon went on crusade that they might not behold the evils of the nation and the desolation of the realm, and shortly after Archbishop Edmund left England in despair because the Pope had ordered him to provide for three hundred Romans in the first church benefices that fell vacant. He died in the same year at Pontigny, where he had sought refuge like St. Thomas before him. He was canonized in 1246. The Pope's constant demands were not received without protest, the rectors of Berkshire declared that they would not give for the war against the emperor because he had not been condemned by the judgment of the church, because as all churches had their separate patrimony, the English church ought in no wise to be taxed by or pay tribute to Rome, because the pope had no dominion or proprietorship over England, and because such demands were a robbery of the poor and an attack upon the just rights of the English patrons. The protest represented the great mass of English feeling. In 1241, the king had caused his wife's uncle, Boniface of Savoy, to be elected Archbishop of Canterbury. In 1242, the Pope sent a new extortioner, Martin by name. In 1244, even the king protested against the papal demands, and when he found that the revenues held by Italians in England amounted to 60,000 marks, more than the revenue of the crown, was very angry and began to detest the insatiate greed of the Roman court. Yet the abuse was not checked. Seven years later, Grosteteste declared that the pope's nominees had revenues within the realm three times as great as the royal income. The English Parliament, as the Great Council had now come to be called, sent a formal protest to the Pope, which was read at the Council of Lyon, but the Pope Innocent IV took no heed. Year after year the exaction continued, and the new Archbishop Boniface was more active in asserting his own rights than in protecting those of the Church. One great bishop alone stood out, Robert Grosteste, who had been rector of the new order of friars of St. Francis, and who was a devout and holy man of great wisdom and honesty, had been elected Bishop of Lincoln in 1235. He reformed his own vast diocese with the aid of the friars, and was especially stern in enforcing the obedience of the monks to their rules. Men called him the destroyer of the monks, but all knew his true spiritual earnestness. He was a friend of Earl Simon, to whom men were beginning to look as the leader of the party that sought reform. He talked with him and with his friend Adam of Marsh, of government, and was the tutor of his son. But while Simon was preparing to seek a reform of the state, Grosteste was fighting for a reform of the church. He ceaselessly opposed the Pope's attempts to tax England for his own benefit, and protested in person before Innocent IV against the corruption and avarice of his court. At last, in 1253, the Pope demanded that he should give the next vacant prebend in his cathedral to his nephew, a boy, an Italian, not in holy orders, and quite without any intention of coming to England. Grosteste absolutely refused, in a letter declaring that such a demand was made for destruction and was utterly incompatible with the holiness of the apostolic see. He died shortly afterwards, protesting with his last breath 
against the evils of the time the pope's demands had now taken a new form in 1252 innocent the fourth offered to richard of cornwall the kingdom of sicily of which he declared that frederick the second was rightly deprived in 1255 henry accepted it for his son edmund but the barons refused to provide men or money to win a kingdom from a christian monarch or to gain a heritage outside the land for the king's son while henry was thus falling more and more under the control of the popes and thus bringing about a crisis in the relations between himself and his barons his foreign dominions were a constant drain on his resources and his hold over them was slowly being relaxed gascony was ruled at one time by richard of cornwall at another by simon de montfort neither could subdue the turbulent barons simon became engaged in money transactions which induced him to pledge the king's credit without asking his consent the discovery of this as well as the constant complaints of the gascons against his hard hand made an irreconcilable breach between him and henry the king himself made three expeditions to france but in spite of some temporary successes was always in the end worsted war with louis the ninth was a constant feature of this period of the reign but the campaigns were mostly unimportant and the english took only the faintest interest in it in twelve forty two there was a great battle at taiburg in which henry narrowly escaped capture in twelve fifty three henry spent a year in gascony but achieved nothing it was indeed only through the generosity of the french king that he retained his foreign lands at all meanwhile the feeling of the barons was being more and more clearly expressed in twelve thirty seven and twelve forty two the great council seriously warned the king of the evils which he was bringing upon the country in twelve forty four twelve barons were chosen to treat with henry when he again demanded money simon de montfort and richard of cornwall stood together among the twelve and demanded that the king's advisers should be elected by the council and should be compelled to see to the execution of reforms in twelve forty eight twelve forty nine and twelve fifty five the demands were repeated all that seemed gained was a renewal of the charters the great charter and the charter of the forest but they were no better observed yet all the time the barons were growing in power and they were training an instrument which should serve them when the time came to act decisively the old great council in which sat the bishops and greater abbots and all the king's tenants in chief was gradually learning to make itself the mouthpiece of the popular feeling and to claim the right to execute the popular will the king was obliged to grant concessions which implied that it was something more than a mere meeting of his vassals called together to hear his will and to tell him in what way they would provide for obeying it in twelve fifty four when he was himself in gascony there were summoned to the council which was to be asked to grant supplies for the war not only the feudal tenants of the crown but two knights from each shire elected by the county court thus the local courts were brought into connection with the great council and the great council assumed something of the appearance of a national and representative body the council too began to be called a parliament a place where men talked there began to be real discussions not merely the dumb acceptance of the king's commands it needed but one final folly of the king's to make the council stand forth to demand in the name of all classes the ending of the misrule and disorder in twelve fifty seven the time came the king now stood alone richard of cornwall after his marriage with the queen's sister had ceased to care about english reforms and had gone over sea some of the german electors had now chosen him as king of the romans and eager to push his claim to be emperor he ceased his old constitutional protests sir edward the king's son had not yet turned to serious things but was fighting on the welsh border 
and leagued with the mortimers who ruled in the marches against the princes of the native welsh the foreigners whom henry had brought to england his wife's kindred and the lusignan his half-brothers for his mother isabel of angouleme had married her old lover after john's death were not the men to whom englishmen would listen when once they had taken in hand to set the kingdom right in twelve fifty eight at a meeting of the great council of parliament richard of clare earl of gloucester almost the only survivor of the houses of the great earls who had been so plentiful a century back declared that the time had come to redress the grievances under which all classes groaned the clergy were taxed to pay for the war on behalf of the young edmund called king of sicily and henry was pledged to pay for the pope's campaigning on may second twelve fifty eight the king agreed that a commission of twenty-four barons should be appointed to draw up a scheme of reform on june eleventh at oxford a long list of grievances were presented it was the result of long and anxious discussion by the barons in the council among themselves and with the friars preachers and before it was finally produced all who framed it giving their right hand to one another as a pledge of faith swore they would not fail to prosecute their design through loss of lands or money nor through favour to themselves or their relations and after renewing their league and reiterating their oath they confirmed the design which they had conceived that neither for life death or holdings for hatred or for love or for any cause whatever would they be bent or weakened in their intent to regain praiseworthy laws and to cleanse from foreigners this kingdom which is the native land of men of noble birth and of their ancestors so excited was the feeling that men called it the mad parliament the chief articles of the petition of the barons were those which demanded number one redress of the illegal extension of the law of wardship by which the king took the land of minors and compelled them whether male or female to marry whom he would number two that the king's castles should be held by natives not foreigners number three that the forest laws and the king's encroachments on the baron's forests might be modified number four that the king's dues might not be unlawfully extended number five that the jews and the new christian bankers and money-lenders the corsons or men of cahors might be restrained the baron's leaders were richard earl of gloucester simon earl of leicester who now stood forward as the foe of foreigners and friend of the barons and walter of cantaloupe bishop of worcester henry soon saw that it was useless to struggle and accepted the provisions of oxford june twelve fifty eight a commission of twenty-four was appointed the justiciar chancellor and other officers were sworn to obey them and then the king's council was chosen anew and it was ordered that the state of the church should be amended and the king's household reformed and that parliaments be held twice a year the londoners joyfully welcomed these declarations and many of the foreigners foreseeing what would be their fate fled at once from the land in a solemn scene the provisions were confirmed by the king and all the great men the bishops stood with lighted tapers in their hands says robert of gloucester an oxford monk who was very likely himself present and the king and the other high men of the land likewise and the bishops cursed all those who should undo these laws and then the king and others said amen and threw down their tapers to confirm the curse but it was clear enough that this would not mend all wrongs henry was eager to be released and the barons were alarmed at the fickleness and inscrutable duplicity of the king he saw that simon de montfort was now his rival and he knew not what his design might be one day they met in a storm when henry took refuge where the earl was dwelling what do you fear said simon the storm is now past henry sternly answered the thunder and lightning do i greatly fear but thee by the eyes of god i fear more than all the thunder and lightning in the universe in january twelve fifty nine king richard returned from germany and was compelled to take oath to obey the provisions 
later in the year henry and simon went to france and all claims on normandy and anjou were yielded up to louis the ninth in return for the confirmation of the limousin perigord and quercy and a sum of money already the barons were beginning to quarrel among themselves and on october thirteenth twelve fifty nine edward the king's son with the bachelory knights or small feudal tenants not barons of england demanded that the twenty-four should put forth some of the reforms they had promised this request could not be refused and accordingly the provisions of westminster were issued twelve fifty nine these restricted the powers of the sheriffs and forbade the grant of land to churches without leave of the donor's lord but were mostly concerned with matters of feudal interest and showed that the barons unlike those who won magna carta were not caring for the people or the church thus few changes were made only the government was not the king's but earl simon's richard of clare earl of gloucester who had thus far acted as de montfort's helper died in twelve sixty two in twelve sixty one the king fortified himself in the tower of london and it was so hard to make peace between him and simon that it was agreed to submit their differences and the rights as to the provisions to the arbitration of the wise and holy louis the ninth of france the pope had absolved henry from his oath to the provisions but sir edward and king richard stood firm to their words the next years were years of great disorder henry was away for months in france and edward was making war on the welsh the londoners hated and despised the queen eleanor and their attacks on his mother at last made edward ready to join in fighting the barons war began at gloucester in twelve sixty three but on january twenty third twelve sixty four king louis issued his award called the mise of amiens by this all the disputed points were given in the king's favour he was declared free to choose whom he would as ministers the provisions were annulled but the great charter and the charter of the forest were confirmed simon would not submit though he had vowed to accept the decision he was at this time fighting on behalf of the welsh princes against the lords of the marches he seemed eager only to make a great power for himself he had boldly won the battle for reform but when it was won his character seemed to change he would hear of nothing now but his own supremacy his party did not begin well early in twelve sixty four being in need of money they slew nearly four hundred jews who dwelt in peace in london little thinking as the christian chronicler says who looked with horror on the crime that harm would happen unto them great sums were seized from the richest jews and this much was taken by earl simon so that says the chronicler who favoured the royal party he might not be free from the guilt of robbery and murder it was the londoners indeed who made peace impossible negotiations they broke up and they continued to insult both king and queen war broke out in the spring the king was at first successful he took northampton and nottingham and edward took tutbury the castle of one of the barons earl ferrers of derby then the armies marched southwards and after fighting at rochester and tunbridge met early in may at lewis simon made offers of peace telling henry he wished to free him from his foes but henry knew of no other foes than those in simon's army and on may fourteenth they joined battle sir edward routed the londoners and avenged their insults to his mother but earl simon defeated the rest of the royal army and both henry king of england and richard king of the romans were captured then henry was compelled to make the mies of lewis by which he vowed to obey the charter to employ only englishmen to submit to a new arbitration and to give his son edward and his brother's son henry as hostages then a parliament appointed three councillors earl simon the bishop of chichester and the young earl gilbert of gloucester to nominate nine who should be a permanent council without whom the king might not act 
at the end of the year a summons was issued for another parliament to this the bishops and abbots were called and five earls and eighteen barons and also for the first time in english history not only two knights from each shire but also two burghers from such of the towns as earl simon thought loyal to him thus a great step was taken following that of twelve fifty four toward bringing the people of the shire courts into touch with the government of the land but earl simon says the chronicler who favoured him was not content with keeping the king a captive which indeed was contrary to magna carta but took the royal castles in his own power disposing of the whole realm according to his will and his chief offence was that he claimed the entire possession of the revenues of the kingdom the ransom of the captives and other profits which according to the convention ought to have been equally divided between him and earl gilbert his sons too quarrelled with earl gilbert then edward who had been in charge of henry earl simon's son managed to escape by pretence of a riding match and gathered troops in the welsh marshes edward defeated the earl's son simon at kenilworth and on august fourth twelve sixty five surrounded the earl's army in evesham town simon marched out of the streets and up the hill toward edward's forces and a hot fight ensued the king whom simon had always led about with him was dragged into the fight by the barons and was in great danger as he was disguised he could only call out i am henry the old king of england and do not strike me i am too old to fight at last when his helmet fell off he was recognized and saved by his son's troops the day went ill for the barons hemmed in on all sides they fought gallantly but hopelessly and earl simon fell dead in the thick of the fray for the next two years some of the barons held out but they were at last overcome and by an agreement at kenilworth one of the montfort castles october twelve sixty six the charters were confirmed and the barons admitted to peace on payment of a fine finally a parliament at marlborough confirmed most of the reforms that had been made during the years of strife for long years men mourned the great earl simon in spite of his cruelty and his ambition he had seemed too many to be fighting for the good of church and state and the government that he gave was better than the king's misrule we cannot say what he had planned to do in the end whether he would have given up all the power he had won to a parliament or even to the other barons certainly he never gave up the control of the king or the country to other hands but the people loved him and the friars mourned his loss in many a poem and tale his sons were evil men and two of them sacrilegiously slew young henry of germany king richard's son as he was at prayer in the cathedral of viterbo as a retaliation for their father's death the last years of the old king henry's reign were peaceable his son edward led many gallant knights with him to a crusade in twelve seventy while he was at acre in twelve seventy one the treacherous emir of jaffa sent a messenger who stabbed him with a poisoned dagger he was near dying but the skill of an english surgeon who cut out the poisoned flesh saved his life soon after he was called home by news of his father's illness he left the holy land to the mercies of the saracens and before the end of the century the last citadel of the christian kingdom was taken edward heard on his way home of his father's death henry expired on november sixth twelve seventy two and edward was everywhere peaceably accepted as his successor he did not hurry home for he and his good wife eleanor of castile whom he had married in twelve fifty four were royally entertained by the pope the burgundians the flemings and the french king he landed in england on august second twelve seventy four england had changed greatly since henry the third became king men had grown more to feel the national unity and the barons had cast off all lingering attachment to their norman lands the great council had been growing into an assembly that talked and acted in earnest the law courts had been developed 
and the king's bench for suits in which the crown was concerned the common pleas for suits between subjects the exchequer for revenue cases and the chancery for suits which could not be brought before the other courts were all in working england had changed in many ways but most of all perhaps in the growth of a new and powerful religious feeling through the coming of the friars as the towns grew and trade developed as the population increased and men of all classes had a wider outlook the church became unable to meet all the demands upon her for instruction in learning and righteousness the parish clergy were poor and ignorant the monks who had done so much for england a century before now that their building was finished and their estates were laid out came less and less in contact with the poor except in the country and in the heart of the largest towns there was need to minister to the thousands who gathered on the outskirts of the cities and settled outside the walls free from the restrictions of the guilds during the century eleven fifty to twelve fifty a large population had grown up which was outside the care of the parish clergy and very often outside the law too men who left the country villages when they could and wandered in search of work or settled near the great centres of trade disease too was rife among the poor folk who were huddled together within and without the walls of the towns leprosy and typhus and malignant fevers carried off many victims there was great need for physicians both of soul and body the need was supplied by the heroic work of the friars two orders were founded early in the thirteenth century they both called themselves mendicants they were to have no property and to live wholly on alms the franciscans were founded by st francis of assisi who gave up all he had called poverty his bride and brought together poor brothers to revive the work of christ on earth their work was to minister to the poor the vile and the sick the dominicans founded by st dominic a spanish canon were intended to preach and thus to awake the masses to a sense of higher things the dominicans who came to england in twelve twenty were called black friars the franciscans who came four years later were grey friars others followed orders founded in imitation of them the white friars or carmelites and the austin friars the work of these men was quite different from that of the monks they went everywhere entering the parishes of clergy who were negligent and the districts which no priest served and preaching teaching tending the sick and ministering to the dying at first the franciscans were pledged to avoid all secular learning but it became impossible to avoid entering into the intellectual work of the day and in a few years they and the preachers became the leaders of thought at oxford and cambridge as well as in the foreign schools grosteste was the first rector or head of the franciscans in england and adam of marsh was among the brethren devoted as they were from the first to the towns where the keenest life congregated they soon came to influence the nation very deeply in politics and in social life as well as in religion men came everywhere to live more simply to be more charitable and friendly to each other to think less of the distinction of class and clan and more of relieving the sufferings of the sick and poor hospitals were built and endowed great nobles made rules of simple life for their households men and women in high place joined themselves to the order without leaving their work in the world but pledged to live lives of self-denial and charity medicine began to be carefully studied and the natural sciences in religion the change was still more marked instead of being content with a hasty hearing of mass the people rich and poor came to hear sermons to attend religious ceremonies and to devote time and labour to work for each other a sterner life began to prevail among the clergy the bishops took care to see that the monks kept the rules of their order and the clergy who had often been silently allowed to marry in spite of the custom and orders of the church abroad were ordered to put away their wives the parish priests were ordered to lead the people to devoutly and attentively hear the sermons of the friars of both orders and to confess to them and soon the bishops come to say that the face of the land was changed 
that a new standard of duty was raised up among all classes and that to them that dwell in the valley of the shadow of death hath the light shined going in and out continually among the people and themselves poor as the poorest and often of humble birth the friars came to know and to express the feelings of the people about the government and the chief men of the day the oxford scholars and the wandering friars wrote popular songs bewailing the wrongs of the church and of the state and shrewdly glancing at the faults of king and barons and pope and bishops thus the franciscans and the dominicans threw all their strength into the struggle against the misrule of henry the third and helped greatly to give to the reforming movement the success it obtained while the great earl and the noble barons with a few of the bishops led the fight against papal and royal tyranny and the historians of the great monastic houses wrote the truths of the struggle for the eyes of the future the friars and the lesser clergy gave a voice to the popular feeling and showed what it was that the people clerk and lay really needed and how they regarded the great issues and the great men thus with edmund rich and robert grosstest and walter of cantaloupe to speak boldly on public grievances with great friars such as bonaventure and robert kilwardby to be worthy of high office in the church and scholars such as alexander hales roger bacon and duns scotus to guide the progress of thought england under henry the third did not lack leaders among churchmen and in the state edward the first himself succeeded to the best traditions of the reformers of his father's day End of chapter five chapter six of king and baronage a d eleven thirty five to thirteen twenty seven by william holden hutton this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. The Reign of King Edward I, 1272 to 1307. Edward I was crowned with his wife Eleanor on August 19, 1274. He was the first king whose succession had been recognized without question from the moment of his father's death as due to his hereditary right he was better known and perhaps better loved than the heir of any other king had been cruel and hasty he had seemed in his youth when the barons war began but men soon learned to know him as a true and honourable knight who kept his word and did justice who was stern with wrongdoers but willing always to do right to the people and the state edward had had too the training of a great king he had fought within and without the land in wales in france in palestine he had seen men in cities he knew the foreign sovereigns and he knew also the great barons and the great clerks and lawyers of his own land he was less of a stranger than any of the kings who had gone before him since the conquest he was born in westminster and he lived the greater part of his life which was a long one for those times among his english people when he came back to england to take into his own hands the government of his people he began his rule with two aims which he kept ever before his eyes the first was to bring the whole island if it might be under one sway if not to be the only king of it himself yet to make his power as overlord a real one to be as the old english kings had been called a true emperor of britain his second aim was to give his people a greater share than they had yet had in the government of the land the lessons of the last thirty years had not been learnt in vain he determined to make the courts free to every subject of the realm and the council a parliament of all sorts and conditions of men for england his motto was what touches all should be approved by all quod omnes tangit ab omnibus approbetur for himself it was keep troth pactum serva it was these aims and his lifelong endeavours to carry them out in this spirit that made edward i the greatest of our kings in himself he was not only great he was good he was of frugal simple tastes chaste and truly religious he was above all things a warrior and a sportsman he loved the battle and he loved the chase 
but he was by no means deficient in book learning like all great kings he learned to speak the tongues of the men with whom he had to deal he could talk english latin french and perhaps also spanish he followed his father in patronizing art he was himself a lawyer as well as a statesman the defects of his character were his impetuosity and his violence he was rash passionate vindictive and yet he always believed himself to be following the right he could even descend to a trick and yet he was always an honest man stories are told of him which explain both the terror and the love which he inspired he was awful in his wrath once when he was raiding a deputation of clergy the dean of st paul's fell dead before him from sheer fright he was hasty in his anger he swam a stream and scaled a rock to punish a careless servant and he beat a clumsy squire with his own hands and then made him a present to atone for his violence he was a good hearty companion to poor and rich and loved his jest with the merriest of them he was a devoted husband and a loving father and with all this he was one of the greatest men in an age of great men as statesman lawyer warrior he could compare with the mighty monarchs who ruled abroad in his day and he left as few other kings have done an ineffaceable mark on the history of his own land edward after his coronation turned at once to the work of government robert burnell who had long been his close friend and was a great lawyer and an able statesman he made his chancellor and soon afterwards bishop of bath and wells his treasurer was john kirby bishop of ely he learnt much from francesco accursi a legist from bologna many other great lawyers surrounded him and great barons and bishops were among his ministers antony beck bishop of durham was a fit successor to such men as hugh de puisay he was a great bishop after the fashion of those days but he was also a soldier and a politician in his hands the northern shires over which he watched from his prince bishopric were safe henry de lacy earl of lincoln was truest among the great lay men and served his master steadfastly in war and peace besides the earl of lincoln there were other great earls who stood round the king gilbert de clare earl of gloucester had won his spurs in the barons war he married a cousin of the king and when she died the king gave him his own daughter joan who had been born at acre during the crusade the king's brother edmund who had never won the sicilian crown was earl of lancaster leicester and derby humphrey de boone earl of hereford and roger bygod earl of norfolk were to live to lead the opposition to the king at the great crisis of his reign edmund earl of cornwall was the king's cousin and stood by him closely as long as he lived edward used the great earls as counsellors and generals but he was careful to guard against their political influence becoming dangerous to himself he strove where he could to attach the earls to himself by marriage alliances or on failure of heirs to absorb their heritages into the crown lands so it fell out that under his son their number was much diminished and men said that bannockburn was lost because there were but five or six earls to bring help to the king edward's first work was in wales he knew of old how the welsh princes fought with the lord's marchers and how every trouble in england was only too faithfully reflected on the borders Clewellyn, prince of north wales was not long in awakening the new king's wrath he was called on to do homage he refused in 1273, 1274, 1275, he would not come. In 1276 and 1277, Edward made war upon him, and Clewellyn was driven into the fastnesses of Snowdon. At length he submitted, and was allowed to marry Eleanor de Montfort, Earl Simon's daughter, and the king's cousin. But as a punishment, the land between the Upper Dee and the Conway was shorn from his principality the peace was not for long in twelve eighty two war broke out again Clewellyn was joined by his brother david who before had served with edward the king had tried to introduce english law into those parts of wales which were his and to teach the wild people through english merchants 
and the rule of great barons in strong castles. Everywhere the English were hated, and it was easy to stir up a revolt, south and north joining against the English king. Edward was prompt to avenge. He gathered a large army, he got the church to excommunicate Llewellyn as a traitor, he brought his council to Shrewsbury, and gave his whole mind to the task of conquering Wales. He carried all before him. The war was slow, but the success was thorough. Llewellyn refusing a pardon on condition that he would surrender his rights, and receive an earldom in Ireland, was slain in a chance fight near Bilth. David, who proclaimed himself prince after his brother's death, was captured and was tried before Parliament at Shrewsbury. On October 3, 1283, he died a traitor's death. From this dates the conquest of Wales. Edward now set himself to make it firmly united to the English kingdom. At Rutland, in 1284, he issued the Statute of Wales. By it, the land newly annexed from Clewellyn was divided into five shires, Carnarvon, Anglesey, Merioneth, Cardigan, and Camarthen and everywhere courts like the English were established. Edward's son, born at Carnarvon in 1284, was made, in 1301, Prince of Wales. Still, however, the government of the borders was left to the Lord's marchers, and Edward did not summon Welshmen to his English Parliament or touch the ancient Welsh law. He united England and Wales under one sway, and he tried to benefit the principality by giving it a good government on English lines, but he did no more. He gave, however, to Wales towns and castles such as Bomaris, Bangor, Carnarvon, and Harlech, which should make permanent the English influence, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, Peckham, took in hand the reformation and instruction of the Welsh Church. Thus from Edward's conquest date most of the fine towns and castles and churches of Wales, Thus ten years of the reign went by in the Welsh wars and the Welsh settlement. Then Edward turned to the legal reforms for which he was so well prepared. He was in some sense the first, and he was certainly the greatest, of the English medieval legislators. The law before his time was largely ancient custom, modified by the enactments of different kings, most of which were not intended to be of permanent force. Edward was surrounded by trained lawyers, already judges like Glanville and Bracton, had endeavoured to compress into one book the essence of the many rules under which men lived and which the judges were to enforce. Under Edward this work was continued. Britain succeeded Bracton, and it may be that the king himself designed to make a code. However that may be, he began by reforms which took the direction of a substantial addition to the law. In 1275 he issued the first Statute of Westminster, which provided for the enforcement of peace and order. In 1276 there followed the Statute of Regeman, a revision of the law of trespass. In 1278 the Statute of Gloucester restricted the power of the barons and the jurisdiction of the local courts. To carry out the provisions of this statute, commissioners were sent round the country to investigate the titles by which the barons held their privileges. Writs were addressed to the great lords asking by what warrant, quo warranto, they acquired these powers. It seemed to many that the king was interfering with traditional and unquestioned rights. The Earl of Warren produced an ancient and rusty sword and said, This is my title. With this my ancestors under William the Conqueror won their lands, and with the sword I will maintain them. It was a sign that Edward would have to deal no less than his father with a haughty and independent baronage. In 1279 came the Statute of Mortmain. By this it was intended, in the interests of the barons as well as of the king, to prevent the grant of lands to churches or to clergy as such, whereby the land would be released from its feudal obligations, and the lords or the king be deprived of military services and many other dues. All grants of land to corporations, whereby the land came into the dead hand, were forbidden. In 1283, the Statute of Merchants for the Easier Recovery of Trade Debts, 
in 1284 the statute of Rathlan, already mentioned, did much to simplify the work of the king's judges and financiers. In 1285 came the second statute of Westminster, which covered a large range of law, modifying and reforming. It included the law de donis conditionalibus, which safeguarded the rights of legal heirs to landed property. In the same year, the statute of Winchester revived and reorganized the ancient military force of the land, which had done such good service against King David in 1138 and William the Lion in 1174. It provided also for a police system by the enforcement of the duties of citizens in watch and ward. In 1290, the third statute of Westminster, Quia Emptores, prevented the lessening of a feudal lord's privileges by the granting of land from one of his tenants to a subtenant. From this date all new grants became as grants from the original lords, and no new manors could be created. In later years there seemed little need for new laws. In 1305 the writ of Trailbaston directed the prompt and rigorous suppression of the thieves and marauders who disturbed the land. In 1307 the statute of Carlisle forbade the collecting of money for the Pope. This list shows the comprehensive nature of Edward's legislation, but it by no means expresses the whole of his work in legal reform. Directly and indirectly, by legislation, by the encouragement of a scientific study of law, and by the increase of litigation which was to some extent the result of his measures, he did much both to systematically organize the law courts and to raise up trained bodies of lawyers men began to be advised by attorneys and represented by counsel. The judges became professional men, adhering to their own work and their own courts, and not as under Henry II, made useful wherever the king wanted them. The law courts became easier of access and more rapid, more scientific and more regular in their working. And in the country at large, order was enforced and men were able to live more securely and with a growing feeling of loyalty to the king and unity in the nation this feeling was increased by edward's great work in the development or the creation of parliament as we now know it after various preliminary efforts he issued writs in twelve ninety five for a parliament which should fully represent all the classes of the nation he did not destroy the feudal council of the king which the barons attended because they held land of the king. But he took part of this council, and he took also from the shire courts and the church courts, and out of these he made his model parliament. This contained representation of the three estates of the realm, the clergy, the barons, and the people, or commons. The clergy appeared, by number one, all bishops and those abbots to whom the king sent special summons. Number two, two elected representatives from each diocese and each cathedral. The barons were now distinguished by Edward, who made a practical separation between the greater and the lesser, by summoning the former by special writ, and thus creating the House of Lords, and leaving the latter without any special political privilege. Thus the commons included the lesser barons or knights, the freeholders, the citizens, and Edward created the House of Commons by requiring the sheriffs in each county to cause to be elected two knights from the shire and two citizens from each important town who were to come to the Parliament to represent the community which elected them. These three estates were not yet divided into distinct houses, and the inferior clergy, partly because they already met in their own convocations, rarely if ever obeyed the royal summons to send representatives but a parliament was thus created which fairly represented all interests in the land, and to this parliament Edward gave the fullest competence in advising and in ordaining that had ever been given to any English assembly. He never shook himself entirely free of the idea of kingship as involving a supreme and arbitrary power, but he aimed at, and on the whole he honestly carried out the realization of his maxim, quod omnis tangit ab omnibus approbetur that which touches all should be approved by all. How important this concession was will be seen as we consider the later history of the reign. 
but edward had constantly to turn from home to foreign politics from his great legal and constitutional reforms to the care and extension of his interests abroad during the early years of his reign he was occupied in doing homage for his aquitanian possessions to the french king his cousin and in recognizing his rights as feudal lord in 1279 he succeeded in right of his wife to the county of Ponthieu at the mouth of the Somme, which once again gave to England a footing in northern France. The Treaty of Amiens in the same year made a satisfactory arrangement between the kings, but the next ten years were years of constant political intrigue, though not of actual war. In 1286 Edward went to France for three years, he did homage to the new french king philip the fourth the fair and he busied himself in trying to make peace in europe and preparing for a crusade he set himself to develop the commerce of bordeaux and to found new towns throughout his duchy but the peace did not last long the development of the southern trade which edward had fostered led to war with the north the seamen of gascony and of normandy were constantly fighting in the english channel French ships were captured, and Philip required Edward to give reparation. The English king replied that all men wronged could get justice in the English courts, and when he refused to come to Paris, Philip declared that he had forfeited the Duchy of Aquitaine. After negotiations which the French king used only to gain time, Philip, by an act of shameful treachery, gained possession of a number of castles, and soon of the whole of Gascony edward got up a great european alliance against him but the troubles in scotland and wales and the difficulties in his own land prevented his ever seriously undertaking the french war it dragged on for years with varying success and the french continually aided the scots while edward joined with the flemings against france at length a truce was made in twelve ninety nine when edward married as his second wife the french king's sister margaret peace was made may twentieth thirteen o three by which gascony was restored to the english king scotland claimed a far greater share of edward's attention than france in twelve eighty six alexander the third the last of the old line of scots kings died his heiress was margaret his granddaughter only child of his daughter margaret and eric king of norway she was summoned to scotland and it was arranged that she should marry the young edward of england but she died on her voyage and there remained no one who had clear right to the scots crown twelve ninety a great number of claimants started up and it was agreed to submit the decision to edward i as overlord the rights of england over scotland had been both indefinite and contested and their exercise had depended upon the strength of the sovereign by whom they were enjoyed but edward believed them to be genuine and fully legal and he undertook the task of adjudging the claims as a feudal duty and in simple faith three claimants were prominent henry lord hastings john balliol and robert bruce on november thirtieth twelve ninety two the crown was awarded to john balliol and he did homage to edward for the kingdom for a while the new king ruled happily as a vassal of england but the french war and edward's financial troubles led before long to far more serious disturbance edward had all along been hampered by want of money he had begun his reign with heavy debts of his father's and from his own crusade so long as there was no exceptional demand upon him he had been able to carry on the government without any excessive taxation in twelve ninety he had yielded to popular pressure and had banished all jews from england this was a considerable sacrifice of money to him but the measure was unwise and wrong and it seems to have been carried out in some cases with great cruelty a few years later the king felt the need of those from whom he could readily obtain money but he was too honourable to take a bribe as the french king did to allow the jews to return from this time troubles came thickly upon him his devoted wife eleanor of castile whom men called the peacemaker died in twelve ninety 
and bishop kirkby his treasurer in the same year in twelve ninety two died the great lawyer burnell in twelve ninety four a general rising took place in wales with the welsh philip of france allied himself and he also induced john balliol to join him for the king of scots had begun to chafe against his suzerain when edward began to interfere in local scottish matters by summoning scots litigants to appear before his courts at westminster it was in the midst of these troubles that edward summoned his great parliament of twelve ninety five thus asking the help and counsel of his people in his greatest stress help was not refused clergy barons knights and townsmen all granted liberal taxes ranging from an eleventh to a seventh of their goods with this he prepared to meet the threatened danger to gascony he sent a large force then he prepared to meet the scots first he sent a special summons to balliol to attend his parliament at newcastle on march first twelve ninety six with his barons when they did not come edward prepared to march against them but already a force of near forty thousand scots had burst into cumberland and was ravaging far and near the chronicle of lanercost written at the time in the invaded district says that they surpassed the cruelty of the heathen for not being able to seize upon the strong they wreaked their vengeance on the weakly the sickly and the young children of two and three years old they impaled on spears and threw into the air consecrated churches they burned and they vilely treated and slew women dedicated to god they were stayed by the stalwart resistance of the burghers of carlisle edward did not turn aside he was soon before berwick and took it with little difficulty though with great loss of men on both sides thence he marched on the castle of dunbar was held against him by its countess though the earl himself was in his army the scots sent a large force to protect it but edward's generals proved victorious and on april twenty seventh the castle surrendered to the king in person three of the scots earls four barons and seventy knights were among the captives thence edward proceeded and took roxburgh dunbarton and jedburgh edinburgh yielded to an eight days siege then stirling and perth and on july tenth balliol came to him at brechin and submitted admitting his disloyalty and surrendering the kingdom of scotland into his hand as a justly forfeited fief on august twenty eighth in a parliament at berwick the scots barons took anew the oath of allegiance and renounced their alliance with france edward like henry the second before him at the treaty of falaise took the castles of edinburgh roxburgh jedburgh and berwick into his own hands and he appointed the earl of warren as guardian of scotland he took no bitter vengeance balliol was kept for only three years in honourable captivity and was then allowed to retire to his estates in normandy the barons who had broken their oaths he forgave but when he returned he took with him to england the scots regalia and the ancient stone on which the kings were wont to be crowned and which still remains in westminster abbey set into the chair on which british sovereigns now sit at their coronation thus scotland submitted but edward's troubles were not over in twelve ninety six pope boniface the eighth had by the bill de claricis laicos forbidden ecclesiastics to pay any taxes on church property without the pope's leave edward had already done something to anger churchmen he had compelled archbishop peckham to withdraw some canons which had been issued reflecting on the royal power he had by the statute of mortmain obtained the power of stopping all grants of land to the church he had made great demands on the clergy for money extending in twelve ninety four to half their revenues and they had been reluctant to attend the national parliament which met in twelve ninety five the bull caused an open quarrel archbishop winchelsea who had succeeded peckham in twelve ninety four refused to allow any further grant and the king thereupon declared that all clergy who would not pay were outlawed you that appear for the clergy said the chief justice at westminster take notice that in future no justice is to be done them in the king's court in any matter of which they may complain 
but nevertheless justice shall still be done to all persons who have any complaint against them at this very time other classes were almost equally at variance with the king the barons were chafing under his inquiry into their privileges and his restrictions of their rights the merchants were protesting against the increase of the customs six shillings eight pence on every sack of wool exported had been granted in twelve seventy five it was not hard to organize a determined opposition in twelve ninety seven the king summoned the barons it seemed that his model parliament had soon broken down for the clergy were outlawed and he did not summon the commons edward demanded that his barons should serve for the recovery of gascony while he himself went to flanders to attack france from the north roger bygot earl of norfolk and earl marshal and humphrey de boon earl of hereford the constable refused to go without him their duty they said required their attendance on the king but they had no other obligation by god said edward you shall go or hang by the same oath answered the marshal i will neither go nor hang it seemed as if a new baron's war would break out edward summoned a feudal levy at westminster july twelve ninety seven and there a peace seemed to be made the pope allowed the clergy to make voluntary gifts king and clergy were reconciled edward confirmed the great charter and the charter of the forests the king then went to flanders and his son edward was left to arrange for the reissue of magna carta the confirmation of the charters is an important document besides renewing the great charter and the charter of the forest and requiring that they should be read in all cathedral churches twice a year it declared that the king would take no more such aids tasks and prizes as he had taken without the common consent of the realm and it undertook that the maltote or heavy custom on wool should never again be levied without consent edward accepted and confirmed the act and again in twelve ninety nine he renewed his oath to it in thirteen hundred the articuli super cartas limited the power of royal officials and ordered a forest survey in thirteen o one the charters were again renewed and reform undertaken thus though the king had still some means of taking money apart from council or parliament he stood honestly by his word and kept within his rights but the archbishop and the barons still suspected him and his last years were troubled by their distrust and opposition these last years were again years of strife with scotland wales had again been gradually reduced to submission and young edward had been made its prince but the scots had not remained at peace after the conquest of twelve ninety six the earl warren edward's minister had been attacked by an outlaw of galloway william wallace or the welshman and was utterly defeated at stirling september tenth twelve ninety seven wallace became for a time the ruler of scotland the battle of stirling had placed the land at his mercy and he was a stern conqueror contemporary writers record terrible instances of his barbarity and when he invaded england he spared neither age nor sex the english border lords retaliated with similar brutalities edward determined to bitterly avenge the attack of the governor of scotland as wallace was now called he gathered a great army at york and after a year's delay he was ready to proceed having now made peace with france he pursued wallace to the forest of falkirk there he won a great victory on july twenty second twelve ninety eight and utterly crushed the power of wallace the governor yielded up his office and fled the scots however would not now submit as readily as before they declared that they held the kingdom for john balliol whom edward had imprisoned and they named three regents to rule the land for him war went on without any decisive action till pope boniface the eighth interfered and declared that he was lord of scotland but the english parliament at lincoln in thirteen o one declared that the claim was unjustifiable and asserted edward's right to rule year after year edward fought with varying success till in thirteen o three he overran the whole land 
received the submission of the regents the bishop of st andrews john comyn and robert bruce and after the capture of stirling in thirteen o four drew up a plan for the ruling of scotland by which english judges were to be joined to the scots and the scots parliament was to send representatives every year to the english parliament thus scotland had a second time submitted to the english king no leader still held out and even wallace in his exile was willing to yield on terms the king it appears was ready to receive his surrender but wallace soon changed his mind for he returned from france to scotland and remained in hiding he was captured and executed in london for the robberies murders and felonies of which he had been guilty for the king in his narrow legal view of wallace's actions refused to see in him anything more than a chief of marauders edward thought that scotland was now at peace but it was to remain so only for a short time in the winter of thirteen o five robert bruce grandson of him who had claimed the crown in twelve ninety one murdered the regent john comyn who stood loyal to his oath to edward in the church of dumfries he mustered his retainers and got himself crowned at scone and raised a revolt against the english king edward again marched northwards with his nephew aymer de valence earl of pembroke as his lieutenant wherever he came he conquered but bruce fled from him into the wild north and could not be caught at last edward determined to put forth his whole strength and gathered a great army that he might utterly crush the country as he marched he fell sick he stayed several months at carlisle and when he went forward again he died on july seventh thirteen o seven at burra on sands in his last years and in his scots wars he had been harsh and cruel but he did all in firm confidence in the justice of his cause when he made his solemn vow at the knighting of prince edward in thirteen o six to avenge the murder of comyn and punish the broken faith of the scots he looked on them not as a noble nation fighting for liberty but as a perjured and rebellious company of outlaws whom it would be a shame to him as a king and as a knight not to punish he was a great warrior a great lawgiver a great worker and he died still working under his hand the constitution of england had changed more than it changed for two centuries after he had thrown his whole heart into what he did for his people and he left marks which could never be effaced even in his mistakes we cannot forget that he was good as well as great and his severity does not conceal his true love for his people End of chapter six chapter seven of king and baronage a d eleven thirty five to thirteen twenty seven by william holden hutton this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami the reign of edward the second thirteen o seven to thirteen twenty seven edward the second was a very different man from his father he was unlike any of his ancestors who had reigned in england all the angevin kings had loved to rule whether they governed well or ill edward cared for none of those things he would have been happy as a baron with half a dozen country manors to look after or as a wealthy merchant dealing liberally with artists and craftsmen as a king he was utterly out of place his father had loved work he loved nothing but ease he was weak where his forefathers had been strong and without being actively vicious he had no active virtue it was an age when no king could afford to be idle and the idleness of edward the second was his ruin the new king began by disregarding his father's last injunctions edward the first had been a severe parent had punished his son's faults and had tried earnestly to train him for a life of business now that he was free the son seemed only to despise his father's memory he had been instructed to carry on the scots war with vigour he left it immediately to the charge of aymer de valence his bosom friend piers gaveston a young gascon knight brave but insolent who had been brought up with him had been banished by his father 
Edward II recalled him at once and made him Earl of Cornwall. He then crossed to France to marry Isabella, daughter of Philip the Fair, and he left Gaveston as regent of the kingdom. On February 25, 1308, the king and queen were crowned at Winchester, and the king took an oath to hold and keep the laws which the community shall have made, a clear sign that men knew how great power under Edward I had come to the commons. But such a policy was not one to propitiate the baronage, who took the occasion of the accession of a weak king to assert their own claims to be the real rulers of the land. And while the king was weak, the barons had a strong leader. Thomas, Earl of Lancaster, was the king's cousin. He was the son of that Edmund to whom the Pope had given Sicily in the time of Henry III. He had married the daughter of Henry de Lacy, Earl of Lincoln, the faithful minister of Edward I. He was High Steward of England and Earl of Lancaster, Derby, and Leicester, and in right of his wife he would succeed to the earldoms of Salisbury and Lincoln. His ambition was as great as his possessions, and he lost no opportunity of increasing his power and making his opposition felt. At the king's first parliament the barons united against Gaveston, and the king was forced to banish him. He turned the disgrace into an honour by making him regent of Ireland, but the removal of the favourite did not make the king govern well. Parliament was not called again for eighteen months, and the king obtained money from Italian bankers the Frescobaldi, who collected the customs which he farmed out to them. When Parliament met, the commons were as active as the lords in protest against misgovernment, but the king foolishly recalled Gaveston, and in three months Gaveston had again raised the hatred of the great earls against him. The Earl of Warwick, Guy Beecham, had always been his foe. Lancaster had remained neutral. Now he and the earls of Lincoln, Oxford, Arundel, Hereford, and Pembroke turned against the favourite. In March of 1310, the Council of Barons demanded redress of grievances, and twenty persons were appointed to make ordinances to the honour and advantage of Holy Church, to the honour of the King, and to his advantage and that of his people, according to the oath which the King took at his coronation. The Lord's ordainers included Archbishop Winchelsey, now returned from banishment, Warwick, Lancaster, and Lincoln. They produced to the Parliament in 1311 the Ordinances of London. By these, Gaveston was banished, and the Frescobaldi were to be dismissed. In future, all great officers of state were to be appointed with the counsel and consent of the barons, and without such consent, no war was to be made, and no forces were to be summoned, nor was the king to leave England. The Ordinances were the last great constitutional document embodying the baronial claim to govern the country. They were strikingly similar to the provisions of Oxford in 1258. They utterly ignore the great work of Edward I in admitting the commons to a share in the work of legislation. They reduce the king to a cipher, and the third estate to a mere consenting but unconsulted party. But Edward was too weak to resist. He accepted the ordinances, 5th October 1311, but at the beginning of the next year, as he marched to Scotland, he recalled Gaveston and gave him back his estates. The barons at once prepared for war. They marched into Yorkshire, besieged Gaveston in Scarborough Castle, and compelled him to surrender May 19, 1312. Then, as he went southwards to answer for his deeds at the Parliament that was summoned, he was carried off by the Earl of Warwick and beheaded on Blacklow Hill, two miles from Warwick, on June 19, 1312, in the presence of Thomas of Lancaster. His fate was the result of the king's folly and his own greed, and he had made the baron's jealousy irreconcilable by his flouts and jeers. Warwick he had called the Black Dog of Arden, and Lancaster the Mummer. The nicknames were dearly avenged. Edward was too weak to avenge his death. The Pope, the Earl of Gloucester, whose sister was Gaveston's wife, and the King's own brother-in-law, Philip of France, gave counsels of peace, 
and edward professed to be reconciled to the earls who had done the deed year by year indeed he lost the little strength he had had his father's method of constitutional government was superseded by the method of the ordainers archbishop winchelsea died in thirteen thirteen and was succeeded by the chancellor reynolds henry de lacy too was dead and lancaster now held his earldoms thus in england the king was more than ever the creature of the barons and their leader all this while affairs in scotland had been going from bad to worse robert bruce had captured almost all the chief towns and castles stirling still held out and edward determined to relieve it but lancaster and the barons who had been intriguing with bruce and who by no means wished to see their king a successful general refused to follow him to the war because the consent of the baronage in parliament had not been asked as the ordinances required edward nevertheless gathered a great army he had thirty thousand horsemen besides many irregular levies from wales and ireland as well as england and a body of good archers the armies met at bannockburn near stirling june twenty third thirteen fourteen bruce had a much smaller force and they were mostly footmen but he had the advantage of having chosen the ground and he had digged rows of pits which he fitted with stakes to protect his own position and check the charge of the english knights the english archers were driven back and the furious onset of the knights failed to break the scots stubborn squares of pikemen the confusion that followed led to flight and when the feeble king turned his rein all the english troops streamed from the field in disorderly rout the gallant young earl of gloucester edward's own kinsman and his only true friend was left dead on the field the battle of bannockburn won the independence of scotland and it completed the ruin of the english king revolts began in ireland and wales the latter was soon checked but in ireland edward bruce was crowned king was joined by his brother the king of the scots and for three years ravaged the land doing great damage till in october thirteen eighteen he was defeated and slain near dundalk by the lords of the english pale that is the district in which the english ruled lancaster now ruled supreme in england he made the king dismiss his ministers put him on an allowance and required that he should live of his own that is on his income from land and feudal dues and without taxation robert bruce conquered all scotland and even captured berwick and thomas of lancaster would not oppose him in england there was nothing but confusion and private war in thirteen eighteen a new council was appointed but lancaster was still supreme in thirteen nineteen edward made another attempt to recover scotland but was driven back and the scots invaded england and defeated the yorkshire militia at mitten bridge a fight called the chapter of mitten because so many clergy were slain all this while lancaster though supreme seemed to care as little as the king for the exercise of power he would not attend parliament he would not fight the scots and the barons were gradually deserting him and dividing into parties the king was winning over the earls of warren and pembroke and the two dispensers the elder of whom had been of simon de montfort's party in the barons war were holding the position of his ministers the heirs of the last earl of gloucester who fell at bannockburn were the husbands of his three sisters the younger dispenser roger damery and hugh of audley damery and lord battlesmere with pembroke formed a party to oust lancaster from power but they were by no means agreed on their course of action on the welsh marches the earl of hereford and roger mortimer would not keep order and came into conflict with the dispensers on july fifteenth thirteen twenty one the barons in parliament accused and condemned the dispensers as having interfered without authority in the government and having enriched themselves by the perversion of justice they were sentenced to forfeiture and banishment lancaster was again supreme but in october an insult to the queen offered by lady battlesmere led edward to raise an army with which he punished the offender and then marched on to seize the castles of hereford and damery lancaster had not interfered to save the battlesmeres 
he got together an army when it was too late the king recalled the dispensers and was soon at the head of a large force on march sixteenth thirteen twenty two the earl of hereford and the earl of lancaster were defeated by sir andrew harkley at boroughbridge hereford was killed and lancaster taken captive five days later he was tried for high treason in the castle of pontefract and was condemned he was executed as a traitor the king had at last won an unexpected triumph a parliament at york revoked the ordinances and declared that all matters to be established for the estate of our lord the king and his heirs the realm and his people shall be treated granted and established in parliament by our lord the king and by the consent of the clergy earls and barons and by the commonalty of the realm this was a return to the good rule of edward i and it showed that his son now claimed to rule the kingdom by the popular council and not as the barons wished only through the nobles but edward whatever his intentions seemed incapable of ruling well he marched against the scots but he had no success sir andrew harkley whom he trusted intrigued with bruce and was executed as a traitor at length a truce was made with the scots for thirteen years in may of thirteen twenty three it was a time of bad harvests and much misery among the poor edward left government wholly to the dispensers who proved greedy and thought only of enriching themselves so matters went on from bad to worse and at length even edward's wife turned against him in thirteen twenty three charles the fair the new king of france demanded that edward should do homage for his great french thieves of guienne and gascony the dispensers whose support lay only in the king refused to let him leave england at length he sent his wife with his young son edward whom he made duke of aquitaine and count of ponthieu at the french court she made friends of her husband's foes and she fell in love with the banished lord marcher roger mortimer a plot was arranged in which even the king's brother edmund earl of kent joined on september twenty fourth thirteen twenty six queen isabella landed at orwell earl henry of lancaster joined her with the remains of his brother's party and all the bishops too pronounced against the king edward fled to wales the dispensers were captured and hanged young edward was declared guardian of the kingdom and he summoned a parliament in his father's name then the king was captured and put in prison at kenilworth on the seventh of january thirteen twenty seven parliament met and was asked to choose between father and son no one save four honest bishops protested in favour of the king's rights the miserable archbishop reynolds uttered the wretched saying that the voice of the people was the voice of god six articles were drawn up as reasons for the deposition number one the king was incompetent to govern he ever chose ill counsellors and he could not tell ill from good number two he had always resisted good counsel and had spent his time in unworthy occupations number three by his lack of government he had lost scotland ireland and gascony number four he had injured the church and imprisoned exiled and slain many great men number five he had broken his coronation oath number six he had ruined the realm and could not mend himself on january twentieth the articles were sent to the king by the hands of twenty-four representatives of all classes in parliament he admitted their truth and resigned the crown he lingered on for eight months while england was ruled by isabella and mortimer with savage cruelty henry of lancaster first had charge of the deposed edward but he was soon transferred to less scrupulous hands on september twenty first thirteen twenty seven he was murdered in berkeley castle men said in a horrible way thus miserably perished the son of the great edward a man who might have ruled with his people's love as he was left with the strength of his father's government no more piteous tale of mere idle refusal of goodness and of honest work is to be found in english history and certainly no more piteous retribution it was a true king that men in the fourteenth century needed and edward the second was no king in heart or in mind 
weakness often meets a harsher fate than crime but edward's weakness was a crime no less than a failure end of chapter seven chapter eight of king and baronage a d eleven thirty five to thirteen twenty seven by william holden hutton this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami england under the house of anjou eleven fifty four to thirteen twenty seven the two hundred years from the accession of stephen to the death of edward the second cover one of the most momentous periods in our annals in eleven thirty five england was a conquered country at the mercy of a strong king or a turbulent baronage governed by foreigners slowly settling down under a system of land tenure which was new and strict and oppressive the old self-government of the english was suspended if not destroyed but its survivals and the influence of routine gave hope for the future the experience of the unchecked independence of hundreds of petty lords was bitter but useful it gave strength to the sentiment of loyalty and confidence in the throne which was the true support of henry the second of richard the first and of the great edward in thirteen twenty seven england had enjoyed a self-government of a different kind but of much greater possibilities than the early english system had ever offered the people were not only recovering the management of their own local affairs they were obtaining control over the central government itself the change was a great one and it was due most of all to the action of the kings it is impossible to exaggerate the influence of the individual character of the monarch in the twelfth and thirteenth centuries a strong king could often carry all before him a weak king could lose more than all a strong king had won the hearts of kings and their thoughts are in the hand of god wrote a minister of henry the second and by his judgment they stand or fall thus it was not for meaner persons to judge them or even to discuss their actions this was the theory that commended itself to men's minds under a born ruler of men it was quite different when men had a king who could not discern between good and evil the career of henry the second strong but wicked finds the completest possible contrast in that of edward the second weak but not vicious thus the power of the nation abroad and its internal condition also seem during this period at the mercy of the man who may be seated on the throne but in reality by a slow process the work of the great kings is giving to the people the power to control the kings themselves it is the policy of henry the second and of edward the first that makes the deposition of edward the second possible the two centuries then leave the king scarcely less strong but they place his strength more definitely in union with his people and therefore ultimately under their control with the baronage the case is different the barons of edward the second turbulent and selfish though they were are of a different race to those who fought for stephen or matilda in eleven thirty five the barons were determined to continue as independent feudal magnates in thirteen twenty seven they had learnt that it was impossible to resist the central authority and they therefore endeavoured to win that central authority for themselves besides this they had been foreigners ruling with a foreign king over a conquered people they became englishmen under a king as english as any of our sovereigns and they felt themselves of the same race as the yeomen and the citizens beneath them the church was the most stable institution of the period it fought with strong kings and it coerced weak ones it was by no means always wise or happy but it gave england great administrators and hard-working statesmen and it helped to win magna carta and the confirmatio cartarum during the whole of the period it could be said that the church was on the side of liberty while men like becket edmund rich robert grosstest and a crowd of forgotten friars helped to give englishmen a high ideal of purity and self-sacrifice and to mould the best features of english life 
the people themselves were winning new rights during this time the system of the manor by which the lord ruled despotically over all men dwelling on his land whom the lawyer held to be little better than his slaves was being gradually relaxed the local courts of hundred and shire which the tenants or vilain came to attend conferred or recognized rights in them which grew as time went on the people could make oath before the king's justices they could grant and assess taxes in the county court and they came to vote for men who should speak for them in the national councils but the greatest change of all was certainly in the towns from the accession of henry the second to the death of henry the third there is a continuous succession of charters to town bodies and corporations the towns were organized with extraordinary complexity and completeness the great merchants had a guild this began as early as william i which grew to govern all the trade in the town and which came to ask the kings for privileges of ruling and of freedom for the city itself thus the charters of henry the second and richard the first were often granted to the citizens of the merchant guild the towns won the right to collect their own dues according to their own rules and pay them in a lump sum to the treasury without the interference of the king's sheriff then they came to seek what towns in france were winning already full control of all their own affairs and recognition by the state as a single unit thus the great towns when they received the grant of a communa this was general under john and henry the third were treated as a single person and might deal just as a great baron or bishop might directly with the state they won the right of choosing their own chief magistrate under richard i london was allowed to choose its mayor and lincoln its reeve and the privilege soon became common within the towns the men of each trade clustered together and held themselves close in streets which bore the names of their trades watching with special watchfulness over their own privileges thus each craft came to have its guild lads had to serve apprenticeship under a craftsman till they were free to work on their own account and at length were admitted to be master craftsmen themselves these guilds protected the workmen and kept up the work done to a worthy standard but they were jealous of intruders and more and more kept each trade in its own family succession but the towns were constantly growing and the country folk came eagerly to them to secure their full freedom and to enjoy the privilege of having their own free houses and their own work uncontrolled save by the rules of the guild thus the towns increased enormously during the thirteenth century and it was in them that the church and especially the friars found their chief work the wealth that came from trade showed itself in new houses and new churches stone houses like the famous house of aaron the jew still standing in lincoln began slowly to replace the cottages built of wood and wattles stone churches everywhere superseded the old english churches of wood they began too to build in a new style st hugh of lincoln the friend of henry the second and richard the first was one of the earliest to introduce the work that is called early english or pointed in this there are long narrow lancet windows pillars with clustered shafts finely moulded and decorated and tall pointed spires and the churches are generally long with fine vaulted roofs the cathedral of salisbury begun in twelve twenty by bishop herbert lepore and finished in twelve sixty is a splendid specimen of this style and we have also the choir of lincoln minster and the king's hall at winchester and later the abbey of westminster which henry the third rebuilt over the shrine of edward the confessor in the latter part of the thirteenth century came another change the windows began to have tracery work in simple geometrical figures additionally decoration was constantly being given to the stonework to the pillars and the windows both in geometrical and in flowing style and thus we reach the period of architecture called decorated which flourished during the greater part of the fourteenth century and which gave us much of the work in the cathedrals of york and exeter and ely the men who built these great churches must have been both rich and religious thus we find the merchants recognized as a separate class taxed separately and holding special councils with the king under edward the first 
and thus the chroniclers are full of stories which show the simple and beautiful religious faith which existed among the people at large church services were very well attended the poor working people could often go to church daily and on saints days there were holidays when all men attended special thanksgivings and then held public games and entertainments there was great reverence for special holiness of life many englishmen were canonized as saints but the people had held them for such before the church gave them the name such were st thomas becket st hugh of lincoln st edmund rich st richard of chichester and men called a little boy whom they said the jews murdered at lincoln st hugh while some even desired to give like honour to earl simon de montfort the monasteries found employment for many who would otherwise have starved the great religious houses scattered over yorkshire lincolnshire east anglia the borderlands of wales and scotland and less thickly over the midland and southern shires did a great work in reviving agriculture and in founding what became the chief english industry the wool trade under richard i john and henry the third the wool of the cistercians was a great part of the wealth of england these kings seized them without scruple and it was on the wool and wool fells sheepskins that edward i placed special taxes when he was in greatest need a new feature was added to english life by the coming of the friars by whom the poorest people were brought nearer to the ministrations of the church and were also made to express their feelings as to the needs and dangers of the time the great schools or universities in the chief monasteries and especially in the towns of oxford and cambridge grew enormously under henry the third even under stephen there had been lectures in roman law at oxford by the end of the thirteenth century the two universities became the chief seats of learning in england and brought up the men who led the religious and political thought of the day thus through the greatness of her kings and their foreign possessions through her trade and the influence of her church and her universities england had become known as a great power in europe to retain this position she depended not a little upon her military forces at home as has been already mentioned the old english feared or national militia was kept up it did good service under stephen and under henry the second and it was reorganized and improved by the latter king by henry the third and by edward the first it remained without great alteration during the whole of this period but it was gradually becoming connected more with police arrangements and the ordinary keeping of the peace than with active military duty edward the first began the custom of issuing commissions of array to certain individuals by which they were empowered to select from the national militia a certain number for special duty these were paid by the crown the feudal obligation to serve forty days in the lord's cause gradually broke down under the difficulties that arose out of the constant demands of the king's foreign wars henry the second endeavoured to avoid the danger as well as the inconvenience of calling out the whole feudal force by taking a fixed payment scutage instead he then used the money for the employment of mercenaries but hired troops as the only kind of standing army known were always unpopular in england henry the second after eleven seventy four never employed them again in england and nothing so decisively turned the nation against john as the raids of his foreign hirelings as normandy was severed from england the obligation to serve in the field began to sit lightly on the english barons st hugh's famous refusal to pay for troops out of england was followed a century later by the refusal of the two great earls to serve themselves except where the king went and in the latter case the earls asserted that they served rather as officials the marshal and constable than as feudal barons bound by the holding of their land to military service to their lord during this period the english were acquiring the unquestionable sovereignty of the seas henry the second's fleet was an important feature in the national strength the defeat of the french succors in twelve seventeen by some forty ships of the sink ports under hubert de burra was the first battle in which england was saved from conquest by the courage of her seamen 
the encouragement of these towns sandwich dover hythe new romney and hastings was one of the chief works of the kings between twelve hundred and thirteen hundred they were required to furnish ships and they received great and special privileges in return though thus recognized and rewarded by the state they were little more than nests of pirates claiming to act under royal sanction but quite as often fighting only for their own hands by henry the third's shipping ordinance of twelve twenty nine it was declared that the sink ports and neighbouring towns furnished fifty-seven ships and one thousand one hundred and ninety-seven persons to man them edward i greatly increased the privileges of the ports and the long sea fights of twelve ninety three which led to a practical war with france show the strength as well as the piracy of the half-recognized english fleet besides the ships of the sink ports henry the second richard i and john did much to develop a regular english navy under richard i for the first time england undertook a distant expedition by sea and his fleet was famous among those of the crusading nations for its strength and for the strict regulations under which it was placed john appears to have been the first sovereign to give a permanent engagement to seamen and under him the supremacy of england in the channel was asserted more clearly than it had been claimed by previous kings the sovereignty of the narrow seas however was long contested it was admitted by the flemings in thirteen twenty but little practical result came from the admission england however could more than hold her own in the channel and her fleet could keep off all invasion under edward the third she was to become unquestionably supreme such was england learning union within and having strength without when edward the second ended his feeble reign great kings had made her great in europe and as yet she had gained perhaps more than she had lost by her introduction into the foreign interests which sprang from her sovereign's foreign birth and inheritance if she was no farther advanced than some other lands in the self-government of her people her progress had been sure and her free institutions were more firmly based than those of france or of the spanish kingdoms and within in spite of poverty on the outskirts of the towns and the hard lives of some of the half servile poor men as a rule lived well and comfort greatly increased during the two centuries we have traversed it was an era of emancipation among the poor in town and country the population rose to nearly four millions the growing riches of the country were seen not only in its buildings but in the strong substantial clothes men wore the bright colours the fine furs and the costly jewels that were loved by men and women alike foreign connections had brought some foreign tastes but englishmen were able to hold their own the church and the baronage as well as the people of the thirteenth century were strongly national and the great king edward i was truly a national monarch end of chapter eight recording by pamela nagami in encino california in december two thousand and seventeen end of king and baronage a d eleven thirty five to thirteen twenty seven by william holden hutton